Hey everyone, I'm back. Laszlo Montgomery here with part eight this time of the Tea History Podcast. In the Song Dynasty, tea had established itself as a component of the Kaiman Qi Jian Shi, the seven necessities of daily living in China. The original six were firewood, rice, oil, salt, soy sauce, and vinegar. Back in times before the Song, if you woke up on a deserted island, you had to have those six things in your household. But now, in the Song, the seventh thing you couldn't do without became tea. That's how important tea had become in China. Tea houses were now commonplace in China. It started in the Tang, maybe the Sui, but the number of tea houses in China during the Song exploded. And once the tea houses proliferated as much as they did, they in turn served like a bellows to stoke the fires for the emergence of new kinds of Chinese tea culture. Every city in China had their own little take on tea. Song Dynasty tea culture drew from all these individual customs and practices from not only the palace in Kaifeng, but also these individual tea cultures that developed in the great cities along the Yangtze and in the watery worlds of Zhejiang and Jiangsu. In these tea houses, the whole culture of Cha would be practiced throughout the Song Dynasty. Chan Buddhism and the Song reached a golden age. If you'll again let me use that worn-out, overused cliché. The whole notion of Chan Buddhists embracing tea so fervently as an aid in meditation had already gained national prominence under Chan Buddhist Master Xiangmo of Lingyan Monastery at Taishan, the sacred Mount Tai near Jinan. He was one of the best-known Chan masters of his age. The Kaiyuan era of the Tang, this was the most splendid period of the most splendid time in the Tang dynasty. These were Emperor Xuanzong's best years. It was supposedly Master Xiang Zhang who used his prestige as Chan master at such a sacred spot as Mount Tai to propagate the benefits of drinking tea to stave off sleep during meditation and as an aid in getting through the evening when fasting. Such words praising tea from someone as revered as Chan Master Xiangmo of Lingyan Monastery was quite an endorsement. This was sort of like an official sanction, but it's, it's just a legend, like so much of the history of tea. And whether or not this whole story is true remains to be historically verified. The old saying, Cha Chan Yi Wei, tea and Chan Buddhism, one taste, was already a well-known saying by the Song Dynasty. The Buddhist monasteries held tea so close to their bosom and were enthusiastic proponents of all things great about tea. They lived amongst a population that, I guess you could say, was rather Buddhist at the time. And it can't be denied that monasteries were a walking, talking PR department for the merits of drinking and savoring tea. Some might say Chinese tea culture really spiked during the time of Huizong. Again, Go check out that China History Podcast four-parter on his life, CHP episodes 132 to 135. Many high-profile luminaries of the Song, who I mentioned, Tsai Xiang, Tsai Jing, uh, Su Shi, and others, throughout their career, extolled the virtues of tea and wrote poems and calligraphy inspired by the taste and aromas of tea. But when it came to culture... No one during the Northern Song Dynasty was bigger than Huizong. Tea culture in the Northern Song hit a high note during the first half of Huizong's reign from 1100 to 1126. He took everything Lu Yu said, and like Tsai Xiang, added his two cents worth. Like Lu Yu, he gave, in 20 steps, a state-of-the-art commentary on tea's history, how to grow it, the conditions you need, how to make it, assess it, grind it, and so on and so forth. Huizong's masterpiece was called the Da Guan Cha Lun, the Treatise on Tea, also called the General Remarks on Tea. Huizong published this during the pleasant part of his tragic reign in 1107. One of the things about Huizong that would have been unheard of prior to his time was that he occasionally used to enjoy preparing tea for all his counselors, 
When they'd get together on official business or after hours, this is the kind of thing Hui Zong liked to do. As in all the arts of the time, this emperor loved to be looked upon as the final arbiter in what was art and what was good taste. White tea makes its debut on the tea stage around this time. Hui Zong had a section of his Da Guan Cha Lun where he says, quote, White tea is different from all others and deemed the finest. With wide-spreading branches and thin, shiny leaves, the trees grow wild on forested cliffs. Their product is very sparse, however, and there is nothing one can do about it. Four or five families on the Bai Yuan Tea estate have some trees of this kind, but only a handful of them come to leaf, so no more than two or three bagfuls can be gathered each year. Both shoots and leaves are small. Steaming and firing them is rather difficult. For if the temperature is not exactly right, they will taste like ordinary tea. Thus, a higher order of skill is needed, and the drying must be carefully done. If everything is exactly as it should be, the product of such trees will excel all others. End quote. You see, it was during the Song that masters figured out the youngest buds would produce a unique taste as far as mildness, subtlety, and refreshing taste. Hui Zong, he wasn't pulling your leg. It was indeed hard to get, and because the raw material was limited, so was the supply. It's called white tea because so young are the buds used that are picked that they still have these tiny white hairs on them. I've read the white tea of the Song. It was not the same as the white tea we're familiar with in our day. That was a creation of the Qing Dynasty masters in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. In the last 10 years or so, white tea has been marketed in the U.S. in all kinds of forms by the tea and beverage industry. It's hailed for its ability to help you with weight loss, lower your blood pressure, give you healthier bones and skin, and of course, because of all the antioxidants, it also has the same cancer-preventative properties as green tea. White tea, because it has the absolute minimum amount of processing involved in taking the tea leaves to the final product, retains the highest level of antioxidants. Because of the chemical EGCG mentioned in Tea History Part 2, epigallocatechin 3 gallate, researchers in Germany have produced studies showing white tea helped people lose weight. Five white teas that you may have heard of are silver needle, Long Life Eyebrow, Tribute Eyebrow, White Peony, and Snowbud. I randomly checked an online tea store and saw Yin Zhen Silver Needle Tea going for $30 per quarter pound, so $120 per pound, all the way from Zhenghe County to your door. Zhenghe and Fuding are the two places most famous for that northern Fujian white tea. And with regard to the best tea bowls, Hui Zong was always chasing the thinnest, most delicate bowls. In his Da Guan Cha Lun, he said, The best kinds of tea bowls are very dark blue, almost black. They should be relatively deep so that the surface of the liquid will attain a milky color, and also wide to allow for whipping with a bamboo whisk, end quote. And as for the whisk, Hui Zong explains, quote, This should be made of flexible bamboo. The handle should be heavy, the brush like slivers, light, their tips sharp as swords. Then, when the whisk is used, there are not likely to be too many troubles. End quote. Emperor Hui Zong, everybody. He didn't get to drink too much tribute tea in his last years. Teas scented from flowers were another song innovation. For the first time, teas scented with jasmine, rose, osmanthus started showing up. Osmanthus is known as Gui Hua Cha in Mandarin. And today it's one of the great health drinks in the American tea industry. The government didn't only muscle in on the tea and horse trade. Tea had become important and sophisticated enough whereby the government, in all its wisdom, decided a system needed to be created to standardize the grading and quality of teas produced in the market. Not surprisingly, the most sought-after teas in the Song Dynasty were the ones whose leaves came from trees or bushes growing in the shadows of China's most sacred and illustrious mountains. The Luyu of Japan lived during this time of the Song. 
Again, I don't want to get too deep into the history of tea in Japan, but it's important to know of Myoan Eisai. I mentioned him in part two. He lived 1141 to 1215. Eisai had multiple claims to fame. He's most credited with bringing green tea to Japan from China. He also studied the Rinzai school of Chan or Zen Buddhism that had been around since the Tang Dynasty. It wasn't one of the larger sects in China, but it sure caught on big in Japan. Asai, he made his first trip to China in 1168, a Buddhist pilgrimage, of course. He stayed in China for 23 years and returned to Japan, not only with Chan Buddhist scriptures, but tea seeds and the latest tea cultivation know-how. He planted these seeds in the Uji Hills, just outside Kyoto. For the rest of his days... Asai propagated a lot of what he picked up in China after two decades of tea drinking. The whole idea about the Japanese tea ceremony as art and all the unique rituals and aspects of Japanese tea culture are said to have begun with Asai's return from China in 1191. The Heian era had just ended, and this was the Kamakura period, one year before Minamoto no Yoritomo. A name no less great in Japanese history as Tang Taizong is to China. Let me read a poem by the Japanese Buddhist monk Myoe. It's called The Ten Virtues of Tea, and shines a light on what tea, by the song, meant in Japan society. Myoe's ten are, quote, Tea has the blessing of all deities. Tea promotes filial piety. Tea drives away evil spirits. Tea banishes drowsiness. Tea keeps the five internal organs in harmony. Tea wards off disease. Tea strengthens friendship. Tea disciplines body and mind. Tea destroys the passions. Tea grants a peaceful death. End quote. I'm sure it sounded better in Japanese. Let's finish off with Wulong Tea. Between now and the end of this series, I'll try and give you a nice general overview of all the main teas. If you like tea and just want to learn a little more to expand your awareness, I hope this show offers you something useful. The list is very long of tea experts who write blogs, books, run tea shops, online stores. Some have YouTube channels and Facebook and Twitter accounts. You could really learn a lot fast and get right on it. So let's look at Wulong. I heard three banal versions of how this tea got its name. Wu means black. Long means dragon. This tea is so good, it's in a class by itself. Of the five categories of tea, white, green, yellow, red, and puar, a sixth one had to be added for wulong. It wasn't green, and it wasn't red or puar. Nowadays, black tea and puar tea are used interchangeably. But wulong, it was somewhere in between. And that spectrum of how oxidized the tea masters allowed the leaf to get varied anywhere from 10% to 85%. So the tea masters in all the great wulong-growing tea gardens in Fujian, Guangdong, and Taiwan have all kinds of ways to work their leaves to give their tea its unique everything. In the beginning, there was Beiyuan tea from Fujian. This was brick tea from the Tang that became one of the earliest yucha, or imperial tribute teas for the emperor. Huizong himself mentioned Bei Yuan tea as superior in his treatise, the Da Guan Cha Lun. This Bei Yuan tea was made into tea cakes called Long Feng Tuan Cha, Dragon Phoenix Tea Cake. These weren't bricks, they were cakes that might fit into the palm of your hand. Again, with a nice ornamental wrapper. This is one of the calling cards of Song Dynasty tea culture. When tea bricks sort of became passe, the good people there in Beiyuan needed to come up with an encore to their once famous product, Longfeng Tuan Cha. They came up with this new kind of partially oxidized tea that, although processed in a laborious fashion requiring a few extra steps, yielded a particular flavor as yet never tasted. Back in the old days when Westerners were just starting to learn about tea processing, 
The word fermentation got bandied about as the chemical process that turns the leaves from green to black. But fermentation, as you remember from high school microbiology 113, only takes place where there's no oxygen. Oxidation, as the name suggests, requires oxygen. When you break open that Lipton tea bag and see that tea, that is fully oxidized black leaf. If you don't oxidize it, or as they used to say in the trade, don't allow for fermentation, then you will have green or white tea. Black tea is fully oxidized. Oolong tea, that's somewhere in between. And just how in between is the difference you can taste from tea garden to tea garden? I don't like to generalize, but in general, if you want to compress all the different kinds of oolong tea into three main kinds. First, you have the renowned Wuyi rock teas of the Wuyi Mountains, Wuyi Shan in northern Fujian. Then there is Tia Guan Yin or Iron Buddha or Goddess of Mercy tea. I'm sure you've had it before. Guan Yin in Buddhism helped the needy. If you were down and out and needed a miracle, you prayed to Guan Yin the goddess of mercy, as she's sometimes referred to. Tia Guanyin tea comes from Anxi in the south of Fujian. This is just north of Xiamen and west of Quanzhou. The third kind of oolong used to be known a century ago as Formosa oolong. This is oolong tea from Taiwan in a class by itself. One of the telltale signs of oolong tea are the edges of the leaf. When you look closely, after the leaves have been steeped, the edges have a slight russet color to them. This is part of that magic worked into the leaves by the master artisans who make oolong. For oolong tea, the yield plucked will be greatest in the spring, but it's the leaves picked in the autumn that are considered the most fragrant. Don't forget the six steps to drinking tie guan yin, Observe, listen, view, smell, taste, appreciate. As I said in a previous episode, the Wuyi Mountains are located in northern Fujian, not far from the border with Jiangxi. This area is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The tea makers in Wuyi Shan aren't going to wow the tea drinking world until the end of the Ming, beginning of the Qing, but their green tea though still processed in cake form in the Song, by imperial decree, one day will be morphed into this special loose-leaf tea that the Wu Yishan area will become esteemed for. This very special tea is called Yen Cha, or rock tea. Rock tea because the original trees grew out of these rock cliffs that made up the historic tea-producing area of Wu Yishan, the Fujianese tea craftsmen of the late Song and early Ming, it seemed, weren't completely familiar with the pan-firing technology that had been mastered by the producers across the border in Anhui. They had learned that when you pick the leaves and allow them to wither a bit in the sun, get them nice and pliable and loose, if you fire them, or Sha Qing in Mandarin, kill the green, you can halt any further chance of enzymatic oxidation of the leaves. That's why they're green. But if you don't fire the leaves or steam them, they start turning black on you. These cha nong, or tea farmers, up in the Wu Yishan area of northern Fujian, either on purpose or by accident, figured out how to control the level of oxidation through the application of heat at critical times. They learned how to wholly or partially oxidize the leaves as they wished to coax that very particular flavor out of these Camellia sinensis leaves. The most famous Yen Cha or Wu Yishan rock teas have names like Da Hong Pao, Tie Luo Han, Bai Ji Guan, Shui Jing Gui, as well as Shui Xian, Ba Xian, and Rou Gui. In this little corner of Fujian, everything that happened geologically over millions of years allowed the soil, the climate, the altitude to offer 
optimum conditions to grow tea. And today's Wu Yishan tea growing area is broken down into three main categories. These are Zheng Yan tea, Ban Yan tea, and Zhou tea. Zheng Yan grows in the rocks in the highest peaks of the picturesque mountains. The Ban Yan tea grows in the foothills surrounding these rock mountains. The Zhou tea grows near the banks of the two rivers that wind through the Wu Yishan area, the Zhou and Ba Xian rivers. It takes seven stages of processing for your average Wulong tea. Withering, tossing and bruising, oxidation, fixing, rolling and forming, drying, and firing. So easy to name those steps. It's not the steps, but how they perform each step. That's where individual craftsmanship takes over, like craft beers. There's no limit to how you can subtly manipulate the process to derive a unique tea-tasting experience. Besides the soil and climate, how much you let those leaves oxidize, and how you work the leaves during the process is what determines the outcome. This whole way that leaves from a Camellia sinensis bush or tree turn into the high-quality teas we know today is not an intuitive process at all. That's why it took so long for those outside China to figure it out. As we could see from these past episodes, it took the Chinese centuries to get everything just right. We've seen how tea evolved from the crudest, most bitter brew. So bitter, tea's Chinese name shared the Chinese character for a bitter vegetable. And between the time of the ancient Ba and Shu states and Sichuan, through the Qin, Han, Tang, and now the Song, tea evolved and fits and starts into this now very refined and sophisticated level in the Song. Not only were these Wulong tea masters of Fujian blessed with land that had the perfect terroir, they were also most expert and innovative in working with the leaves. Famous tribute tea villages dotted Wu Yishan in the north and in Anxi in the south, where Tie Guan Yin is made. Tea didn't come to Taiwan till the early 18th century. But when it did, and a few years after those tea trees planted their roots in that nice soil of Nantou, Jiayi, and Hualien counties, the masters there also turned out quite a magical oolong tea that would gain world acclaim. And we'll come back again and look at oolong and many other kinds of teas. Oolong tea is special, and it's during the Song that Fujian teas sort of muscled their way past the established players and really came to the fore. Nowadays, especially in the health products industry, oolong tea is often touted as an aid to weight loss and a remedy for a number of afflictions or maladies. In the Ming and afterwards, it seems all that mattered was Fujian province. In the next episode, the Ming Dynasty founder Zhu Yuanzhang is going to make an imperial edict that says henceforth, tea should be packed in a loose leaf form and not into these brick shapes anymore. You'd think with everything we know today about tea, that this idea should have come a lot sooner. Alas, the whole notion of loose tea like we know and love it today only began with the Ming Dynasty, the second to the last Chinese imperial dynasty, going back to the Qin. And that's what we'll look at next time. For now, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from L.A. in El Estado Dorado. I hope you'll find it in your heart to do the right thing, and consider joining me next time for another delicious episode of the Tea History Podcast.